you know, I'm, I'm really, really excited about where we're at right now. Um, and I, I didn't even plan to start this way, but um, I guess just to share my heart straight off the back that I, gosh, I want it so much. That move of God. I, I, I can't, I don't know if I can recall the time in my life when I've wanted something so much. I, I, I really don't. Um, when, I, when I first sort of came into the church and started kind of moving around Christian circles, the, world, the word revival was sort of almost hushed and whispered in corridors. It was kind of almost... I don't know, it almost felt like people were a bit afraid to say it. Um, and I don't know what that's about. Maybe, I, I, you know, reading history and stuff, I can tell there's, pro- there's been disappointments in the past, hasn't there? And there's been, there's, there's been stuff. Um, but I don't know, this just feels different. Where we're at right now, it just, it, 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 it feels different. Um, so... So yeah, so I, I'm I'm bringing something today that um, quite organically actually didn't didn't plan this. I, I'm going to preach from two Samuel six, um, and it's going to follow on quite actually quite neat and tidily, even though we we didn't discuss it at all from what from what Sarah brought a few weeks ago. Um, it's just general life advice, isn't it? If you're following on from Sarah Cosgrove, then you you're probably in a good place. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so, so before I jump in, um, I'm going to give a bit of context, um, because I'm over, because I'm an over explainer. So, um, that's what I do. So I'm going to talk specifically about his presence in this. And, and I, and I, and I want to preference really big picture here is that God has always wanted to share his presence with us. There's never been a time when God hasn't wanted to share his presence. It was never supposed to be like this, you know. It was never supposed to be this, this awkward divide, this kind of, this, this, this weirdness. It was never supposed to get to this. You know, in, in Eden, we were walking hand in hand with God through the, through the garden. And, and, and it's important to, to start there because otherwise this isn't going to make any sense. Um, Sin entered the world, and it caused this. It caused that 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 divide, all of it, that that thing that you feel. I, I can't put a word on it, but you know what I'm talking about. This, whatever that is, that started in Eden. Um, and what the revival, what a revival is, is it, it's it's taken us that step so we can we can be with God again. We can walk. In the garden with God again. Um, it's coming. It is. Um, <laughs> but there's some steps we have to go through. There's some stuff we have to go through. And uh, Ali mentioned it. Confession is, is one of them. We, we have to kind of get ourselves right. Because if God's presence just drops, it's dangerous. It's, it's dangerous. Um, and it's out, it's out of love that that divide is there. Because it's actually taking care. Do you know, just as, as an aside, um, God, I'm, all, I'm all over the place already, but never mind. Um, when, I was, when I was preparing this, I, I've got... Do you remember when we started this kind of series and we talked about preparing the hearts and Ali gave us those candles and we all got around the front here and we had those candles doesn't matter if you can't remember. Um, so I've still got mine. Um, and I lit it, and I just sort of sat with it there for me for a bit before I started kind of putting things down and reading and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and because I'm one of those silly boys that likes to play with fire, um, I was messing with it, and I burnt my thumb. <laughs> uh, and it, that... Then it hit me. It hit me there in that pain. Ow. Um, still got a blister. But um, 
God's presence is like that. It's like a raging fire. Beautiful. It's holy love. But to just jump straight into that is dangerous. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to... So, <laughs> over-explainer. Um, I'm going to... Th- 2 Samuel 6 talks about the ark. The, the ark of God. And, and as, as, as Sarah was explaining, there's, on top of the ark of God was the mercy seat. And it was where the presence of God descended on um, when there was the tabernacle. I know I'm going fast here, but... Um, so, in a build-up to 2 Samuel 6, whistles stop talk, because otherwise it won't make sense. Um, there's been lots and lots of battles. The Israelites um, have got this rival, the Philistines, and they're and the back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and in one particular battle, the Israelites start losing. And they, they get this bright idea that, oh, I know what to do here. What, I'll do, what, we'll, what we'll do here is we'll go get the Ark of the Covenant and we'll bring it into the battle like a good luck charm and then we'll win. Because the, the full of these stories of the past of where you know, Moses, who split the sea, and you know, when the presence of God comes, it usually goes well for the Israelites, but they, they, they forgot something. They forgot something quite important. They forgot all reverence. They came and they wanted to use the ark of God, the mercy seat, the, the, the throne of the presence of God as a good luck charm. And what happened was when they brought, when they brought the ark in to the, to, the, you know, to the battle, the Philistines saw it and they thought, Oof, you know, they had a bit of anxiety there because they'd heard the stories too. Um, but the Israelites lost that battle. They lost it. No supernatural aid came. They lost it. Um, And the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it with their gods. They put it in a tent and they put it with all sorts of other gods. Um, Some strange stuff happened (laughs) in that. All those other gods miraculously ended up bowing to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Plagues broke out. It, uh, you know, it was a mess. It was a mess because that's a whole. That was the whole. That was the throne of the presence of God. It wasn't supposed to be used as a good luck charm. It wasn't supposed to be chucked in any old tent with a bunch of other idols. Um, and so it got dangerous. It got so problematic for the Philistines, in fact, that what they decided to do was they decided they'd had enough of all these problems breaking out. So what they did is they stuck the ark on an old cart and sent it off to a guy named Abinadab's house. I'm going to say lots of names in this, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing them right, but just, just humor me. Humor me. Um, and, and, and so there the ark has stayed until, until now, until we're getting into this. Um, so... Last bit. So, David, David has just won a huge battle. He's just, you know, they've, they've defeated the Philistines. It's great. Everybody's happy. And here is where 2 Samuel 6 starts. So, if you, if you want to read it on your Bibles, could do. I think it'll come here. Um, I'm going to keep stopping and starting through it. So, um, David's just, just won this battle. Um, they're okay now. They can go and get the ark. So, so here's where we go. So David, again, brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadad, which was, on, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahiah, sons of Abinadad, were guiding the ark of God. They, they, were guiding the ark with, they were guiding the cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahiah was walking in front of it. David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Okay, so I'm just going to add a little bit in there. So, Knowing the story, you can already see where this is going wrong. Already. 
Because what's happening is, already, is even though, you know, I, I, I'm sort of, when I'm imagining this in my mind, I'm imagining the worship's on point, you know, that it's all tight, it's all good together, it's a great, everyone's celebrating, every, everything's going good. But wait, what a minute, you've just put the ark of God on a cart. David just assumes here that, you know, he doesn't have to think about all the Levitical law. He doesn't, think, he doesn't have to think about what this actually is, what the presence of God actually is. He just thinks it's better. It's, it's just good enough to be better than the Philistines, and I'll put it on a new cart rather than, rather than an old one. You know, it's, it's the equivalent. You know, I can say this because I used to own one. It's like the equivalent of sticking the Ark of the Covenant in the back of a Fiat Panda. <laughs> Gosh, I'm glad I didn't offend anyone. Do <laughs> you know what? I loved that car. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm going to read the next bit. So when they came to the threshing floor of Nacron, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God. Because the oxen stumbled, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Oh, so I feel a bit sorry for us uh, sometimes. Um, and I kind of get that. And it, and, it, and it almost felt like that was the moment when I touched the candle that, that Ali gave us and, and, and burnt my thumb. It, it kind of felt like this. And, and you know, I've looked at lot, what, lots of kind of interpretations of this. This is one of those tricky passages in, in Scripture, isn't it, that we, we, we like to skip over quickly because it, it's a bit difficult to get your head around. Um, but it's so important. And I think it's saying, to, uh, it's really come into it to me. And I think it's saying something to us in this point in history where we're at, this moment in history, especially when it comes into regards of preparing our hands <laughs> You know, we talked a lot about preparing our hearts. Now we're talking about preparing our hands. You know, some people say that, you know, Uzza was arrogant enough to think that God needed a hand. Um, I'm not sure, though. I'm not sure that what it was. I, I, th- I mean, there's some of that in it, but I think it was something more like Uzza assumed that his hands were cleaner than the dirt. That's what came to me when I was thinking about this, and, it, and they weren't. They weren't. This is the this is the mercy seat. This is the this is the throne of the presence of God. And when it won, when it when it wobbled and he, and he and he reached out and he touched it, he didn't know what he was doing. And 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 here's here's the thing in all of this. So so this is why this came to me, and it's a really important point, And I'm going to try and communicate it as well as I can here. I don't necessarily think the heart is wrong here. I don't necessarily think that. I think what it is is the hands weren't prepared. And I need to, and I need to kind of try and flesh this out and, 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 kind of, and kind of say what I mean by this. It's, I don't think the heart was wrong of the Israelites to want to reclaim the ark of God. I don't think that was wrong. I don't think it was wrong to want to dwell in the presence of God. I think the heart was right, but they were unprepared. That's what it is. They hadn't done the due, I can't pronounce it, due diligence. Thank you. Um, Because if they'd have really understood how, what this moment was, what, what, what the presence of God really meant, they would have known there was some, there was some other stuff to do before you can just get the ark of God and put it on a cart. Um, just as an aside, it's not an aside really, but I, I think we do this a lot. We kind of, there's a, there's a temptation sometimes to reach out for something before you're ready for it. Just to, just to give you a, a small analogy, I have a theory, um, and it's a theory about mothers. And you can try this later. So if you know a mother, or maybe you are a mother, um, wait until, until she's kind of half distracted or something and just hold anything out. 
anything. Doesn't matter what it is, just hold anything out. I bet you she takes it. I bet just absentmindedly she'll just go. There's a thing, I've been doing it, I'm gaty for years, she doesn't know. Um, <laughs> now she does. Um, yeah, that, that's my psychological theory for you. But, but there's, there's an impulse, there's nothing wrong in that heart. There's, there's, you know, the heart posture there is just a, a heart posture of care. You know, the, the arc wobbles, I try and steady it because I don't want it to fall in the dirt. Um, and, but, but this can be dangerous, this impulse can be dangerous unless we do these steps. Ali's already mentioned confession, I'm going to get to it a little bit more later, but that's one of a, a, that's a big step to take. You know, your heart can be right. You can get your heart right now. You can do it right now, right now, this second. You can, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been doing this very morning before you got here, right now, this very second, you can, you can turn your heart, you can orient it towards God. That doesn't mean you're ready to carry his presence. Because he's holy. He's a holy God. I know I'm bringing something quite challenging here, so I'm going to make a deal with you. Hear me out, and I'm going to try and hold it together emotionally. Um, So let me carry on reading. So then David was angry, because the Lord's wrath had broken out against us. And to this day... That place is called Perez Uzza. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of God ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. So now this is another thing that happens, isn't it? It's once, once it gets, once we get burnt, once my thumb got burnt, on that candle, there would be a temptation. Well, I'm never touching a candle ever again. I got burnt. I tried it. That's it. I'm finished. I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing if I don't deal with candles ever again. But um, we can't, we, I, don't, I don't want that for the presence of God. I, I don't want that. I don't want past traumas or past hurts or being overlooked or what, whatever you've been through. We've all got something, haven't we? We've all, we're all carrying something. Whatever it was, whatever it is, I don't want that to stop it. <laughs> like I said in the beginning, I want this so bad. I want, it's already started this move of God. I don't want to be left behind. I really don't. And, 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 and there's, there's something that happens for us. You know, um, it's, you know I, could, I, could, I could try and explain it away with psychology, hippocampus and all that, but it's, it's when we get hurt, our emotional reaction to something is to say, that's no longer for me. I'm not going to do that anymore. And, and David here, um, you know, David's a fairly emotional guy. Um, as we heard from Trevor last week, he was a man not without flaws. Um, I can kind of relate to David in, in some senses that he's quite, tur- he's quite turbulent emotionally. And he's gone here from, yes, we beat the Philistines. I'm the king of the world to it's all ruined. <laughs> I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to do that. And it's like in a, in a paragraph, that, that's, that's where he's got to. You know, I can kind of relate to that, if I'm honest. But, but I, I just, I, I, I want to, there's some encouragement in this. I know it's a challenging text, but there's some encouragement in this to keep going, to keep going with it. Um, preparation is important. And, you know, I don't know, you know another, another kind of analogy that might, that might be useful is um, I read psychological statistics in my free time. That's a confession for you. Don't judge me, you Christians. Um, and I would wager, this is, I have no data on this, I'm, I'm making this up, but it's an educated guess. If I was to guess how many people tried reading the Bible in one year, I'd imagine most people in this room has probably tried it at least once. I imagine most people failed on the first go. And I imagine, 
So this is, this, is, this is an educated guess. I imagine it takes the average person three to five times to do it. That doesn't mean the first time you tried it, it was an actual failure. That was part of the preparation to do it. It's, 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 you have to keep at something. Yes, you might have failed. Listen, I've failed more times than I can count. Um, but preparing just means having another go. Sometimes preparing your hands means having another go. If David had have done his due diligence here, we wouldn't be in this, he wouldn't be in this mess. You know, to, to use another example, full of analogies, don't really need another one, but I'm giving it to you anyway. Um, I, so I, I, I do this as well. Sometimes, every now and again, I'll jump in and I'll try and do a park run, which is 5K. But because I'm deluded... <laughs> I think I can just jump in and I've got a pretty good PB at Parkrun actually I'm not going to share it with you cause, because you might have one better and I'm like David I'm, immersion, I'm emotionally fragile so um, but I jump in and I expect to be beating my PB after, and I haven't done anything since Eden was born this is the only exercise that I've done <laughs> Um, and that's about it. But I jump in sometimes and I'm like, <gasps> and I'm like, why does it hurt so much? Because you're unprepared. You're unprepared. Your heart posture's right. You know, I used to say this, you know, um, Katie's flicked my ear for saying this before. Because I used to say, cardio, it's just willpower. <laughs> it's just willpower. I, I get it. I get it now. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to carry on reading. So, instead, David has had this crash. Instead, he took, the, he, took, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Giddite. The Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Giddite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. So, a little bit of a guilty pleasure here. Obed Edom is one of my favourite characters in the whole Bible. I might say something about my psychology. It's because he's not a main character. He just weaves in and out. If you if you carry on reading the 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 arc of Scripture, you'll see him pop up later. He becomes a gatekeeper when the, when the temple gets built. Later, he becomes a worship leader. You know, he, he, pop, he weaves in and out and you kind of got to keep spotting for him. It's like, you know those books, Where's Wally? <laughs> Where's Obed Edom? But there's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, some, there's something brilliant in, there's something brilliant in this. This is the nature of God coming through because it can feel, this can feel a little bit like wrath, you know, striking us down, how dare he touch. But no, 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 straight here, you can see the heart of God shown from this because Obed-Edom, that name, translates as slave of the Edomites. He was a Giddite. He was the lowest of low in terms of social standing. And David has known that this ark is dangerous and it could kill people and he's just jumped it off of his house. <laughs> without much thought or care there for him. I actually think David is, we're getting a bit too, yeah. He's a hero of faith. Um, and I don't know what Obed Edom was doing. I, I don't know what his life was at. It doesn't, it doesn't tell me in scripture. I, I, I can imagine. But whatever he was doing, his hands were ready. He was prepared. His heart was obviously for God. The ark wouldn't have come to him. And his hands were ready because when he, when he received the ark and took it into his household, it was blessed for three months. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't help but imagine what it must have felt like to be sat in your living room with the ark of the covenant. <laughs> there. What those, um, yeah, I'll leave that with you. So let me carry on reading. So now David was told, the Lord has blessed the house household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf wearing a linen ephod 
David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all, the, and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Again, David's emotional roller coaster here. Um, but he, now he'd got it. He'd figured it out. I don't know what had happened. I don't know who he'd consulted during this time. But David now has got it. And this, this is not a popular thing to say, but I'm saying it anyway. Um, it seems obvious to me that since that separation in Eden happened, the price to enter into God's presence again has been a life. It's been blood. That's an awkward thing to say. It's a tough thing to say nowadays. But it's unavoidable in Scripture. Coming into the presence of God costs. Costs big. You know, that's why an animal sacrifice was required in order to enter into the presence of God. Okay, here's the good news for us as New Testament people. It still costs the same. It's not changed. You know, God's presence has not been cheapened so that we don't have to pay any price to enter the presence of God. Something better has happened. That price has been paid for you. It's been paid for you. Do you know, the, the, the cross was such a decisive victory that we don't need to slaughter an animal right here in order to get the presence of God. We just, we can, we can walk into it. We can walk into it here. That's so, so precious. It is so precious. That gift of the presence of God, that didn't come free. That didn't come cheap. It was paid for you. And here's the thing that we need to do. David figured out that, okay, I'm going to have to do the sacrifices in order to do this. I'm going to have to carry the ark appropriately, not stick it on the back of the cart. I'm going to carry it like a king, like it deserved to be carried. The presence of God this is. Um, I'm really grateful I'm really grateful for what Jesus did for us on the cross and so that we can enter his presence. I even wrote a joke here about cleaning up blood on the carpets and stuff, but I can't even tell it. It it just feels too irreverent. Um, The threshold. This is it. I haven't even written this down. It's just coming to me. The threshold for us entering into the presence of God is remembering that is remembering Jesus. This is how we prepare our hands for what is to come. If we forget Jesus and we just think it's about revival, it's about the presence, it's going to break out, people are going to be speaking in tongues, people are going to be healed, people are going to... All that is true. I I believe that. I believe that. I, I, I Honestly, I think that's coming. But where are we without Jesus? Where are we? We're still fumbling around, carrying the ark in the wilderness. That, that's it. We have to remember that this is the threshing floor. This is the, the threshold of it. It's simple. You know, we've already, we've already heard it. Nothing, I'm telling you nothing new. You've heard all this before. There's, there's, no, there's no cheap gimmicks here. There's no, there's no step program in order to do this is simply this it's remembering Jesus remembering the sacrifice that was paid and entering into the presence of God you don't have to do this with a sad face and a a dour heart and no 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 the opposite the opposite that what remember what was paid for you with joy this is for us. I'm going to say one more thing because I've, I've 
I've, I've used a lot of time anyway. Um, a, a phrase has been rattling around in my head for a long time. Um, and it's that God wants, it's from Jackie Pollinger, and it says, God wants to give us soft hearts and hard feet. The trouble with so many of us is that we have hard hearts and soft feet. Swap feet for hands if you want. Or don't. I don't mind. Um, we've spent time working on our hearts. That's not a one-step thing. It's an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing to set your hearts on God. If you do that every day, I imagine what's already been happening in your life, certainly been happening in my life, is this awkward, weird, personal revival kind of moment where things are starting to change for you. Slowly, slowly, you know, gently here. Um, and along the way, we get hard feet, and that doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean anything tough or, or anything like that. It just means that we keep going. We keep going with our hearts set on God. With our hearts prepared to set on God. Over the course of that, you will, you will prepare your hands in remembrance of Jesus all the time. Be with him all the time. Your hands will get prepared slowly but surely. It's as simple as this. If you want to do a park run, if you keep doing park runs, you'll get better at it. If you want to be in the presence of God, keep coming. Keep being in the presence of God. And it's as simple as that. Okay, I want to pray. So, let's pray. Father God, please prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts and prepare our hands for what you want to give us. I know, Lord, from from your scriptures and from your words that it might not be a smooth road. But with you, we can do it. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you. Prepare us. Prepare us, leaders. We love you. We're thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.